It is now time for oral questions. I recognize the Leader of His Majesty's Loyal Opposition. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Standing here today in this seat, I'm feeling the weight of the important role that we in the official opposition have in this province. A lot of people are counting on us. People are struggling. People aren't voting because they've been told over and over again by this government and governments before them that this is as good as it gets, that this is all they can expect. When a government as rich and powerful as this one makes decisions that favour developers over farmers, shareholders over sick people, we have a problem. To the Premier, since this House rose, more concerns have been raised about his relationship with developers profiting from his Greenbelt carve-up and their attendance at family events. Can the Premier explain to Ontarians how they were, are supposed to believe that these developers weren't given a heads-up about his plans for the Greenbelt? The Premier. Well, first of all, I welcome the first question from the Leader of the Opposition. Regarding any family uh, matters, my family is separate than, than the political process. They aren't involved. I had an opportunity to speak to the Integrity Commissioner, Mr. Speaker. I asked him for his opinion, and he found there was no violation. Again, this event was cleared by the Integrity Commissioner. The supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, Speaker, I want to be clear. This is not about the Premier's family. It is about the Premier's behaviour. It's about accountability and the integrity of the office that he holds. Sources told reporters they felt pressured to attend, and some were asked for additional donations of up to $1,000. Did anyone in the Premier's office or any other government staff have a role in making the invitation list for this family fundraiser? Reply, the government house leader. Mr. Speaker, I think the Premier has, uh, has already responded to that, and uh, uh, as uh, the Commissioner all, all also responded to that, Mr. Speaker. But at the same time, uh, uh, we are continuing to move forward as a government to ensure that we continue to build a strong, prosperous Ontario, and it is seen throughout the province of Ontario, whether you travel to the north, the south, east, and the west. The province of Ontario is moving in a very good direction. We are seeing thousands of jobs being created, Mr. Speaker. We are seeing investments come back to the province of Ontario. That is what we continue to fight for, Mr. Speaker. Yes, we're also fighting to ensure that young families can afford to get their first home, something that almost everybody in this place has enjoyed, reasons why families and people came to this province, to this country for generations, Mr. Speaker, is because they wanted the dignity and the hope and the optimism that they could also enjoy that first home. And we are going to do everything in our power to Response. make sure that all Ontarians can enjoy that type of optimism and success for the future, Mr. Yeah. Speaker. The final supplementary. Speaker, it really should not be too much to ask for the Premier of this province to answer the questions that Ontarians have. Again, right. Well, the Premier has a close relationship with developers. We know that. He's acknowledged it. But when the guest list for a family event includes the very developers who later benefited from this government's MZOs and Greenbelt sale, something doesn't sit right. The government has a history of very specific land decisions that somehow end up benefiting their friends and their donors. Does the Premier understand how bad this looks? Not just for the Premier, but for the integrity of his government. Mr. Speaker, I think, uh, again, uh, both the Commissioner uh, has, uh, has responded uh, as well as the Premier. Mr. Speaker, yes, we are making decisions that will put more of the valuable resources of the province of Ontario available for families, for young Canadians who want to be able to buy that first home. But we didn't just start last week. We started from 2018, Mr. Speaker, and at every step of the way, Every step of the way, the opposition has been opposed to that. When we brought on transit-oriented communities to, to build housing around the transit infrastructure, which, by the way, Mr. Speaker, is the largest investment in transit in the history of this province, if not the country, Mr. Speaker, we brought in rules to, to build transit-oriented communities 
They voted against it, Mr. Speaker, so it is no surprise that they are against building more homes for people. It is that hope and optimism that we have been fighting for since we were elected, since the Progressive Conservative government was even formed. Spons. We knew that the people of this province wanted a prosperous province, but they also wanted the hope and dignity of having their first home, and we are going to do everything in our power to make sure that that is affordable for everybody. Thank you. The next question. Once again, the Leader of His Majesty's Loyal Opposition. Mr. Speaker, you want, you want affordable housing? Don't build luxury urban sprawl. Let's start there. <laughs> Speaker, the government doesn't like it because they know that their integrity is in question. And the Premier doesn't like to answer questions because he knows where it leads. On Friday, the Public Order Emergency Commission published their report on the use of the Emergencies Act, and the findings are very distressing. When Ottawa residents were being harassed in their communities last February, while small businesses were being forced to close, the Premier, the Solicitor General, the Minister of Transportation all chose not to help. In fact, it was only when protests moved to other parts of this province that they were forced to do something. What does the Premier have to say to Ottawa residents now that we know the extent of his government's failure to act? Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I think what the report did highlight is uh, the important work that was being done by the uh, OPP for many months leading up to that, Mr. Speaker. And of course, where there are lessons to be learned with respect to uh, better coordination between our, uh, our, whether it's the Parliamentary Protective Service, the OPP, the RCMP, and in this instance, the Ottawa Police Service will do that. But, Mr. Speaker, we are moving forward and we are looking ahead. We are building an economy that is stronger coming out of COVID than it was before, Mr. Speaker. That is what we are continuing to focus on. Whether it's the thousands of jobs and billions of dollars investments that the Premier and the Minister of Economic Development have brought to this province, Mr. Speaker, whether it is the groundbreaking uh, transit uh, system that uh, the, the Minister of Transportation is bringing on, the Minister of Infrastructure, who is bringing, for the first time, broadband services to the entire province. And you know what that means, Mr. Speaker? That means Response. That means that every part of this province, north, south, east, and west, can participate in the economic advantage that Ontario used to have, that was lost under the Liberals, but that we are rebuilding. That's what we're doing, Mr. Speaker. The supplementary question. Well, no, no answers there. No answers there. Speaker, witnesses told the Commission that this government was, and I quote, trying to avoid responsibility for a crisis within its borders. While federal and municipal officials were meeting regularly to try and navigate this crisis, Ontario's Premier and the ministers responsible ghosted the people of Ottawa. The report's chapter on the provincial response is actually titled, Ontario's Absence. Why was the Premier absent? And I really hope the Premier will answer this question. For the people of Ontario and the people of Ottawa, why was the Premier absent when the people of Ottawa needed his help? Government House Leader. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Again, I think the report is very clear that the OPP had resources on the ground for many months uh, uh, in advance uh, of this, and we're sharing Order. and we're sharing information with police services not only in Ottawa but across the province. But as I said, uh, if there are lessons to be learned uh, with respect to better coordination of emergency services on the ground in Ottawa and how they communicate. We will, uh, we will uh, take a look at that. But we are moving forward, Mr. Speaker. We are moving beyond COVID to build an Ontario economy that is stronger than it was coming, going into COVID. We have not stopped on that. As I just said, billions of dollars in economic activity, thousands of jobs are being created in the province of Ontario. We're cutting taxes for the lowest income Ontarians so that they can participate. We're putting billions of dollars investments into Northern Ontario because for far too long, the North was ignored, Mr. Speaker. Now, the opposition the opposition can continue to look backwards, Mr. Speaker. They can continue to forget about the economy. They can continue to forget about and vote against these investments that we're making. But we are looking forward because that's what the people of Ontario want. They want a stronger economy, and that's what we're doing every day, building a stronger, more prosperous Ontario. The final supplementary. Well, Speaker, Ontarians across this province right now are going to be shaking their heads, shaking their heads after hearing that, uh, not even getting the, having the decency of having the Premier respond to the questions that Ontarians have about these very important issues. The very integrity of their government is at stake here, but they won't answer the questions. When the people of Ottawa needed help, 
the Premier sat on his hands. But when wealthy developers want to turn a profit on protected greenbelt land, suddenly the law was changed like that. Right? Is this how our province works now? One set of rules for the Premier's friends and associates, and another for everyone else. Yeah, that's how it is. Government House Leader. Actually, Mr. Speaker, the way the province works is that a government, this government, is working every single day to build a more prosperous, strong Ontario, so Mr. Speaker. Order. It's, not just, it's not just about the economy, right? In order to have a strong economy, you need a better health care system. We're building it. Billions of dollars of investments there. We needed a better education system. Our Minister of Education is doing that. The Minister of Energy, who, uh, who inherited a file that was in chaos, in chaos, has brought stability back to our system, Mr. Speaker, which has allowed the Minister of Economic Development and this Premier to bring thousands of jobs back to Ontario, billions of dollars of investments, Mr. Speaker. And the biggest part of that, too, Mr. Speaker, is that we're not ignoring the North. We're bringing them in here, here. to this, Mr. Speaker. Oh, yeah. At the same time, the Minister of Labour has been working very hard with Response. our partners in Labour to ensure that all of these thousands of jobs that remain unfilled can be filled by the people of the province of Ontario, that they have the skills that they need to help us continue to build a more prosperous, stronger Ontario, a better Ontario that we, that we inherit than we inherited, and a stronger one than going into COVID. Very much. The next question, the member for Nickelback. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Premier. In the last 12 months, Ontario emergency rooms have closed at least 158 times. This is the equivalent of 184 days when the urgent medical needs of Ontarians were not being met in their communities. Speaker, these closures are unacceptable. They put people, health, and lives at risk. Why hasn't the Premier acted to address the crisis in our emergency rooms? Deputy Premier and Minister of Health. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, the one thing that uh, member opposite and I can agree on is that, in fact, it is not acceptable. However, I think that the numbers show that we've actually avoided, through the use of Ontario Health, making sure that we fully utilize in emergency department locums, we've actually avoided almost 2,000 of these uh, emergency department closures. We are building, through your health plan, capacity to add emergency physicians, primary care physicians, nurses. Except you, we have now a plan that actually gives us an opportunity to serve the people of Ontario through their primary care physicians, through their hospital network, ensuring that when people need the care they deserve and expect in the province of Ontario through a fully funded, prov provincially funded system, we will be there with that support. Thank you. The supplementary question. Speaker, I never thought I would see the day when Ontario's emergency rooms would close so frequently. In Perth and Smith Falls, their ER was closed for three weeks straight. In Chelsea, their ERs was closed for 50 long days and nights. The closure constitutes a crisis and is being driven by staff shortages. But the situation cannot be fixed if this government continues to cap the wages of nurses and healthcare workers. When will the government finally prioritize the health of Ontarians, respect our health care workers, and keep our ERs open? Premier. Well, thank you for that question, Mr. Speaker. We know, after 15 years of neglect, how we had health, hallway health care. We're fixing health care, and you're blocking health care every step of the way. Order. You know, the, the, the opposition wants to have endless debates about our health care system, Mr. Speaker, but the people of Ontario just want to make sure they see action happening, and that's exactly what we're doing. We have 203,000 backlog surgeries, and we have a plan to make sure we lower that. We have a plan by making sure we give pharmacists now able to treat more patients with common illness. Just in the month of January, 
Just in one month, 40,000 assessments being completed, with 65 percent of pharmacies across the province providing their ser services. Response? That is 40,000 people that aren't going to the primary care doctors. 40,000 people not going to the emergency room. <laughs> Paramedics are now able to, to make sure that they take care of the people at home. Thank you. Thank you very much. The next question, the member for Newmarket, Aurora. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade. For over a decade, the Liberals chased hundreds of thousands of auto and manufacturing jobs out of the province, including in my riding of Newmarket, Aurora. They simply left the people of Ontario unprepared for the EV future. That's why we have taken action to rebuild the province's auto sector, all while growing the economy and creating good jobs. Speaker, in a sector that employs hundreds of thousands of workers, will the minister explain how the government is attracting new investments and ensuring that Ontario is open for business? Minister of Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade. Mr. Speaker, Ontario has again become the top auto jurisdiction. And to build on this, our government is transforming Ontario's automotive supply chain to build the cars of the future. We're doing this because we lowered the cost of doing business by $7 billion annually, and as a result, we have attracted $17 billion in transformative auto investments in two years. Last week, Magna International announced an historic investment of almost half a billion dollars into six of their Ontario plants. With $23.6 million coming from the province of Ontario, Magna is creating more than a thousand well-paying jobs here in Ontario. This is how we're Response. bringing new life to our auto spec sector. Speaker, there are now 600,000 new jobs created since we first took office. The supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the minister for his answer. It's great to hear that the government is focusing on the province's auto sector and attracting significant investments to the province. We understand these types of investments are only possible because the government is following the Driving Prosperity Plan. To make Ontario an important part of the EV revolution, especially in southwestern Ontario. Speaker, the Magna historic investment and expansion plans in the province. Can the minister please elaborate on how this project will help create jobs in my great riding of Newmarket Aurora as well as across the province? Of economic development. Speaker, this game-changing investment by Magna will create over a thousand well-paying jobs in communities all across the province. This includes the opening of a $265 million EV battery enclosure facility in Brampton, creating approximately 560 new jobs in that region. But Magna is expanding their manufacturing facilities elsewhere. In Belleville, a $35 million investment will create up to 100 new jobs. In Windsor, they're creating 110 new jobs. In Penetanguishene, 15 new jobs. In Guelph, a $140 million investment will create 175 new jobs. And in the members riding, a $24 million investment in Newmarket is creating approximately 75 jobs. Speaker, these jobs are, be are being created all across the province because we are building all of Ontario. The next question, the member for Sudbury. Thank you very much, Speaker. Uh, my question is for the Premier. Speaker, this morning, the Ontario Federation of Labour, the Ontario Nurses Association, and many other representatives of Ontario's workers put the Conservative government on notice that they're fed up with being ignored. They're saying enough is enough. ONA nurses and Ontario health care workers are demanding the Conservative government finally show the respect that nurses and other frontline health care workers deserve. 
My question, Speaker, is when will the Premier finally listen to Ontario's demands for more public funding for public health care, for an end to the staffing crisis, for the full repeal of Bill 124, and for decent wages and working conditions for all workers in our health care system? The Minister of Health. Speaker, with the greatest of respect, a $14 billion increase in health care spending since 2018 suggests quite the opposite, that we have in fact invested in our health care professionals. We are investing in our primary care docs. We are investing in our home care and our hospitals. We are doing that because we understand and appreciate that the status quo is no longer an option. We will continue to make those investments, and while the negotiations happen with the Ontario Hospital Association, Anona, we will continue to invest because that is what a government does when they understand the people of Ontario deserve a publicly funded health care system, and they will get that under Premier Ford. Here, here, here. Supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. Back to the Premier. It seems it's Groundhog Day again because Conservatives love to pretend that they care about health care workers right. and frontline workers and nurses. They use them as photo ops during the pandemic, yep. all while underfunding health care, freezing their wages, and making working conditions worse. This Thursday, Speaker, there will be thousands of public health care workers and supporters joining in solidarity echo and amplify Ontario's nursing demands for better staffing, for better care, mm -hmm. and for better wages. Nurses in Ontario, Speaker, are saying enough is enough, and so are New Democrats. My question is, will the Premier and the Minister of Health be visiting those demonstrations with New Democrats on Thursday, or are they too afraid of what they'll hear from Ontario's frontline health care workers? And the Minister of Health to reply. Thank you, Speaker. You know, when the House rose in December, um, Many members of our party, our Premier, myself, many members, went around and spoke to their constituents, to their uh, stakeholders. And I've had an amazing opportunity to meet frontline professionals who are innovating, who are making sure that the service that the, their patients want and deserve are available. They are telling us that the investments that they are seeing in their local hospitals, whether it's an investment in pediatric beds at CHEO, whether it is, is an increase in hospital Order. builds, 50 new, different hospital builds in the province of Ontario, whether they are Order. new hospitals, expanded hospitals, or renovations. Unprecedented, the amount of money that we are making sure that the people of Ontario get the health care they need Response. in their community in a timely way. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you. The next question, the member for Brantford Brant. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Energy. As Ontario's population continues to grow, we must address our future energy infrastructure needs today. The previous government, supported by the opposition, created a mess in our energy system. This mess led to the people of Ontario facing some of the highest bills in North America. For our economy to grow, in our province to continue to prosper, we need to support innovative and bold solutions that meet our ongoing energy needs. Speaker, what is our government doing to provide affordable and clean energy solutions for the people of my riding, both now and into the future? Thank you. And to reply, the Minister of Energy. Mr. Speaker, and thanks to the member opposite from Brantford Brant for that uh, great question this morning. Ontario has a world-class electricity system, 90% emissions-free. We get over 60% of our power from our nuclear fleet emissions-free. We get about 25% from our hydro fleet emissions-free, Mr. Speaker. There are about 33,000 other generators across the province, wind and solar and biomass facilities, Speaker. Many of those facilities are still producing power at night, though, when demand is low at off-peak times. And under the former Liberal government, what we had happen was this surplus power was sold to neighbouring jurisdictions at a loss. So we're bringing that to an end, Mr. Speaker. Yeah. Thanks to our government's Thank work you. on the Oneida Battery Storage Project, Great. one of the largest battery storage projects in the world, Mr. Speaker. We're partnering with Spons. the Six Nations of the Grand River to build this. We're making full use of Ontario's clean grid by drawing and storing the energy at off-peak times and then dispatching it at times where we're on peak, where we need that power, Mr. Speaker. Making our Thank you. And the supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. 
Back to the Minister of Energy. The Oneida Energy Storage Project is a milestone for Ontario's energy storage sector. It will make our province's electricity grid more efficient, stable, and reliable. This project will help to generate employment opportunities and significant revenue for the people of my riding and our First Nations partner at Six Nations. Battery storage projects like these are instrumental for our economy, our environment, and helping to promote reconciliation with Indigenous communities. Speaker, can the minister please elaborate on how this project will help advance plans for improving the entire electricity grid system? Thank you. And the Minister of Energy. Mr. Speaker, thanks to the towering member from Brantford Brant, our population is growing, Speaker, and as we heard from the Minister of Economic Development earlier, our economy is continuing to grow with huge investments in our province, and that means our demand for clean, reliable, and affordable electricity is continuing to grow too. And when this project, the Oneida Battery Storage Project, goes online in 2025, it's going to more than double the amount of energy storage that's currently on Ontario's grid from 225 megawatts to 475 megawatts. The announcement is another milestone in our plan to build and strengthen our electricity grid. We're going to continue to support innovative and bold technologies like the small modular nuclear reactor program where construction has started over the holidays as well. This also includes Canada's largest procurement of clean energy storage that's in the field right now and, of course, Canada's largest energy storage project, the Oneida project, which we announced a couple of weeks ago with the Response. Premier in this, member, uh, mis this member's region. Mr. Speaker, we're making our grid more efficient. And I must say, when it comes to energy, Ontario is leading the way. Here, here. Thank you. The next question, the member for Toronto, Danforth. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker to the Minister of Transportation. Recently, the Toronto Star revealed that the Minister's office overruled Metrolinx in their efforts to inform the member for Toronto Centre and myself about tree removals on our ridings. Even though we were blocked on instructions from her office, Local MPs and city councillors were informed. Wow. Speaker, why does the minister think it's legitimate to block MPPs from carrying out their duties as elected officials? And to reply, the Minister of Transportation. Thank you, Speaker. And uh, to the member opposite, when the incident was brought to my attention, uh, I made it clear that it was not acceptable and not direction that I support. And why not? Mr. Speaker, because it's actually not consistent with the way Metrolinx has engaged with communities and consulted with people on its transit Order. projects since the beginning. The member opposite himself has had 17 total engagements with Metrolinx, 11 engagements specifically on the Joint Corridor in the past year, in 2022, 37 email correspondence with his office regarding questions about the Ontario line in his ward. Speaker, building large public transit infrastructure projects in the country's most densely populated city is disruptive, and that is why we believe so firmly from the beginning in the need to make sure that we are working closely with our partners, including our municipal partners, on how we get transit built Response. in the city. Speaker, that is why we sought the support of Toronto Council, which we received. But, Speaker, the reality is that failure to move forward with this transit, transit is going to be is is a, is, a, is we're not what the city needs. What the city needs is to make sure we build the transit. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. And the supplementary question, the member for Toronto Centre. Uh, thank you very much, Speaker, and to the Minister of Transportation. Two winters ago, this government sent bulldozers into Toronto Centre to try and tear down the foundry buildings. Thankfully, my community organized and we fought to save them. Now my colleague and I are being intentionally left off notification lists regarding transit projects right in our community. The Minister has an obligation to explain why Metrolinx was instructed to hide that information. And what else is being hidden from our communities or members of this House? Will she apologize for this omission, and when will we expect that? When can we get that? Once again, the Minister of Transportation. Thank you, Speaker. Well, as I've said, um, this incident is not reflective of the way Metrolinx has been engaging and consulting with members of, the, uh, with, of affected Order. communities since the beginning. Metrolinx has and will continue to meet with community members, including elected officials. Speaker, to date, the member opposite has participated in over 30 engagements with Metrolinx in the last two years, at least eight of which were specific to the work at Moss Park. Since 2020, 
There have been 17 meetings between Metrolinx and the Law Society, and over 100 engagements with the City of Toronto that Metrolinx continues to meet with on an ongoing basis. Mr. Speaker, it's no secret the member opposite voted against our plan for a new transit in the City of Toronto when the member was a City Councillor. The member is against building generational transit for the people of Ontario. Every time the NDP order. say no to the Ontario Line Opposition Speaker, come to order. they're saying no to taking 28,000 cars each day Response. off the road. Now, the opposition can continue to try to disrupt and delay our plans, but we are moving ahead with the hard work of making sure that Toronto gets the transit that it needs and deserves. Thank you. The next question, the member for Ottawa, Vanier. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Mr. Speaker, it's been a year since the Freedom Convoy descended on Ottawa to protest, a protest that turned into an occupation that lasted three weeks, three long weeks during which the residents of Ottawa lost their right to live peacefully and without fear. Truly, it was nothing but a nightmare. People turned to their governments asking for help because clearly the local police was overwhelmed by the massive trucks and growing number of protesters encouraged by the lack of law enforcement. The rule of report just released following the federal inquiry clearly indicates that it didn't have to be this way. If the provincial government had put the same energy into coming to the rescue of the people in Ottawa as it did defending economic interests when the Ambassador Bridge was blocked, the peace could have been restored much sooner. How can the government justify its inaction, turning its back Question. on the people of Ottawa? I'm, I'm asking about people, people that can't trust this government anymore, that they have their back. And to respond. Government House Leader. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Uh, as I, I mentioned earlier, it, uh, the report uh, uh, highlights, of course, the, the incredible work that was being done by the Ontario Provincial Police uh, in providing information uh, to the Ottawa Police Service. But as I said, if there are lessons to be learned in how we coordinate with the Parliamentary Protective Service, the OPP, the RCMP, uh, and Ottawa Police Services or other forces, and uh, we will uh, take a look at that, Mr. Speaker. But we are continuing to make enormous investments across this province because what we want to do coming out of COVID is build an economy, an Ontario economy, that is stronger than the one that went into it, Mr. Speaker. And we are hearing the results of all of this hard work. And that includes the people of Ottawa, Mr. Speaker. We are seeing thousands of jobs being created across the province of Ontario, whether it is in uh, uh, in, in the automotive sector, which is being rejuvenated in this province in all parts. And, and, and to be clear, Mr. Response. Speaker, when we succeed in the auto sector, it is good not only just for the GTA, it's good for all of Ontario, it's good for all of Canada. We have the backs of the people of this province because we are building a stronger, safer, more prosperous Ontario. Supplementary question. Thank you. The Commission has conducted an in-depth analysis on what happened, why it happened, and provided lessons learned. This important analysis was possible because of the transparency of the Commission process and the numerous civil servants and political leaders that came forward and provided valuable testimonies. However, there was one political entity missing in action, and that was our provincial government. Our government was missing in action during the occupation, despite numerous calls from myself and several colleagues here on this side of the House. And our government remained missing in action during the inquiry, refusing to appear to provide useful evidence in order to avoid another disaster of the sort. Our government bore parliamentary privilege to shield itself from transparency. But Ontarians and the people in Ottawa deserve a response. So why did the government refuse to participate in the inquiry? Question. How are the people supposed to trust a government that is hiding from its duty and responsibilities? Government House Leader. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Again, there were uh, significant uh, representations from the province of Ontario, including, as I had mentioned uh, before, uh, uh, Deputy Minister, the, the uh, OPP uh, Commissioner uh, uh, was there as well. Mr. Speaker, I remind the member uh, as well uh, uh, that the province of Ontario, this legislature, of course, had a select committee which was reviewing uh, the state of emergency here in the province of Ontario throughout the time that the convoy was, uh, was in Ottawa, Mr. Speaker, and that also included members uh, of the independent members. But we are looking forward, Mr. Speaker. We're looking forward to building a better economy. The world economy has suffered because of COVID, but we know that there are opportunities. That's why we're building not only just transit corridors, but we're building
building roads and highways across the province of Ontario because as the Minister of Economic Development brings more jobs and economic opportunity to Ontario, that means we've got to get our product to market faster. That's Response. why we're building roads, Mr. Speaker. And all the people of the province of Ontario want to participate in a better, stronger, more prosperous Ontario, and we will continue to be focused on doing that as we move forward and beyond. Thank you very much. The next question, the member for Stormont, Dundas and South Glengarry. Speaker, dedicated parents in my riding of Stormont, Dundas, South Glengarry are working harder and longer to keep up with the rising cost of living. One cost in particular that has risen over many years in this province is the cost of childcare. The previous Liberal government did nothing for nearly 15 years as childcare fees on average rose over 400 per cent across Ontario. That's inexcusable. Affordable and accessible childcare is needed to support families and maintain consistent economic growth. Nearly a year ago, our province signed an agreement with the federal government to bring urgently needed financial relief. Speaker, my question is to the Minister of Education. Are parents in my riding and across Ontario achieving actual cost savings that will make a difference in their lives? And to reply, the Minister of Education. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I do want to thank the member for Stormont Dundas South Glengarry for his advocacy as a father and a fighter for affordable childcare in this province. We recognize that under the former Liberals for over 15 years, childcare became totally inaccessible and unattainable. It increased by 400 per cent for an average family in the province. We knew when we came to power under our Premier's leadership that we had to act to make life more affordable for working parents, and we signed a deal, a better deal with the federal government. And I'm proud, Speaker, to confirm that as of January 1 of this year, childcare fees have been reduced by 50 per cent on average, saving anywhere between six to $12,000 a year per child. That is a massive step forward to the affordability program and agenda our government has undertaken for the coming year. We know there's more to do. It's why we continue to provide relief. Mr. Speaker, we're going to increase spaces, we're going to decrease costs, and help families across this province. The supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker, and to the Minister for the response. While affordability in child care is absolutely critical, accessibility is equally important. Families across our province, including in my riding, are facing unacceptable wait times to access child care where they live. This is particularly true in rural and remote areas across Ontario. As our population continues to grow, our government needs to ensure families that the number of child care spaces will also increase, ensuring easier access to child care. Operators across our province need to be supported in their efforts to expand their services. Speaker, back to the Minister of Education. What is our government's plan to increase access to affordable childcare for parents in Ontario? Minister of Education. Uh, well, thank you, Speaker, and again, thank you to the member for this question. We know that we need to build more spaces uh, to meet the demand for rising, the rising demand in our province for families who are looking for affordable childcare in their communities. Too many small towns, rural communities, remote parts of our province in the north, but increasingly even in suburban communities and urban communities, families under the former government have had to wait years on a wait list. Unacceptable. And our government undertook a plan which we've implemented to make fees uh, much more affordable, a 50 per cent reduction to date as of January 1, with a commitment to build spaces. We've announced with the Minister of Women's Social and Economic Opportunity, together we announced a plan to build 53,000 net new spaces. Mr. Speaker, that's going to mean in Peel, 7,000 more spaces, in Simcoe, 3,000 more spaces, in the member's riding, another 465 for Spons. Portland, another 827 in Hastings, 750 in Brantford. We are making this a reality by building spaces, reducing fees, helping families across this province. Speaker. The next question, the member for Ottawa West Lapeen. Speaker, last week the Public Order Emergency Commission confirmed what Ottawa residents already knew: that in the midst of the crisis last year, the premier and his ministers abandoned us. One section of the report says it all, Speaker: Ontario's absence. Justice Rouleau noted that the situation could have been resolved earlier, but the Premier refused to engage and repeatedly tried to shift his responsibility to others. Will the Premier finally take responsibility now, a year later, and apologize to the people of Ottawa? 
to reply, the government house leader. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. As I've said on a number of occasions, uh, the report is quite clear that uh, the OPP uh, were on the ground and were prepared to assist, uh, and in fact, were providing information to uh, uh, the Ottawa Police Service. But I think there are some lessons to be learned with respect to. Uh, uh, how we communicate with each other, be it the OPP, the Parliamentary Protective Service, the RSMP, and the Ottawa uh, Police Service uh, in, uh, in future, Mr. Speaker. But again, we are beginning, we are looking forward. We have not stopped doing that, really. We are building a bigger, better, stronger Ontario for all of the people of the province of Ontario. And I look at the investments in particular that we are making in Ottawa, the health care investments that the, uh, the Minister of Health has has brought to Ottawa the Children's Hospital of Eastern Ontario, the Civic. These are billions of dollars of investments to bring Ottawa's health care system up to date. Come add on to that the investments that we're making in long-term care in Ottawa. Go further than that, Mr. Speaker. The investments that the Minister of Colleges is, uh, is making. Response. And the fact that we have brought back thousands of jobs in, in, uh, in the automotive sector, which means that the high-tech sector of Ottawa can participate in building the cars and vehicles of tomorrow. Good news for Ottawa. Thank you. The supplementary question, the member for Ottawa Centre. Thank you, Speaker. Back to the Premier. I really hope the Premier himself will answer the question that my colleague just posed. Look, I think one of the biggest things we can do in politics sometimes, and it's not easy, is to admit when we're wrong, Speaker. And we now have a federal commission that said a few embarrassing things about this government. It said the Solicitor General said in response to the public safety minister requesting a minute meeting, you're not my effing boss. That was act number one. The mayor of Ottawa asked the premier, will you please come to these meetings with your political colleagues? And the premier said, it's not worth my time. And then to add insult to injury, when Justice Rouleau asked this government, asked the premier, asked then Solicitor General Jones to come to Ottawa to appear before the commission, they invoked parliamentary privilege and ran and hit. Now is your opportunity to turn the page. It's our first day back. Acknowledge you made a Question. mistake. Apologize to the people of Ottawa. Here, here. <laughs> Government House Leader. Uh, uh, the report uh, uh, highlights quite uh, effectively, Mr. Speaker, the work that was being done by the Ontario Provincial Police to help provide uh, information. In fact, the OPP had started uh, a couple of years earlier uh, accumulating information and providing that information not only to the Ottawa Police Service but many of the police forces. Uh, around uh, the province uh, of Ontario. Uh, I know there, you know, many of the opposition members seem to be suggesting that there should be greater debate with respect to who directs the police in times of, uh, of emergencies, whether it should be politicians or it should be the police themselves. That is a debate that the opposition is welcome uh, to bring forward. But we are moving forward, Mr. Speaker, in building a, a better Ontario. Many of the people of this province suffered during COVID, and we want to make sure that as we put COVID behind us, we build a strong economy Order. where all Ontarians can, can, part can participate, whether that is building Response. thousands of new houses so that people can afford to buy their first home, whether that is the work that is being done by economic development. The agriculture minister, who for the first time is putting agriculture to the top of the list because we understand. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next question, the member for Ottawa, Orléans. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. It's nice to finally be back. My question is uh, for the Premier. Uh, Mr. Speaker, perhaps the most important priority any government uh, should have is the health of the citizens that it represents. And a, criti a critical element of maintaining good health is regular access to your family, doctor, or other primary care professional. Right now, here in Ontario, there are 2.2 million Ontarians without access to a family doctor. That's almost 15 per cent of the population, Mr. Speaker, and it's up from 1.8 million just, uh, just a few years ago. Too many of our neighbours, parents and grandparents, fathers and mothers, don't have access to primary care. Too many children don't have access, Mr. Speaker. We're hearing a lot of talk about big plans to reform uh, the health system. What we haven't heard is how this is going to help uh, Ontarians access primary care, Mr. Speaker. So, what is the Premier's government going to do to ensure that these 2.2 million Ontarians can access the important and often life-saving care of family doctor, nurse practitioner, and other frontline health uh, act practitioners, Mr. Speaker. And to reply, the Minister of Health. Thank you, Speaker. I absolutely agree. Primary care is the foundation of our health care system here in Ontario. And I want to remind the member opposite that since 2018, we have, in fact, added 1,800 family doctors to the province of Ontario. Now, we're not done. 
Of course, because if we were done, we wouldn't actually be building two new medical schools in the province of Ontario, one in Scarborough, one in Brampton. That is a historic investment and an acknowledgement, frankly, that we need to build a health care system that's going to be there for an expanded population, for an aging population, to make sure that they get that foundation of a primary care physician that will ultimately add to all of the clinical pieces that we are building to make sure that we have sufficient surgical Response. units, we have sufficient diagnostic units, we have sufficient nurses, Order. personal support workers. We get it. We're making the investments, and you see that as recently as last month when— Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. The supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It's also uh, my supplementary is also for the premier. Since 2018, more Ontarians are lacking access to a family doctor, not fewer Ontarians, Mr. Speaker. Like every other part of the province, the shortage of family doctors is having a profound impact on my own hometown in Ottawa. Ottawa Public Health estimates that some 150,000 Ottawa residents don't have access to primary care, and OPH admits that this number could be wildly underestimated. And the problem is only getting worse. In the first six months of the pandemic, twice as many family physicians stopped work completely uh, compared to trends from the previous decade. In Orleans, several family doctors have announced that they're closing their practices later this spring. Some of these are very young doctors, Mr. Speaker. They're not closing due to retirement. They're closing because of the challenges within the health care system and the lack of support from this government. This is leaving potentially thousands more residents in a lurch without primary care. Now, a group of community leaders, not-for-profit groups, are coming together to explore the creation of a community Question. health centre for Orleans and for East Ottawa. Will the government support the creation of a new community health centre in East Ottawa to provide primary care to these residents? Minister of Health. Thank you. I look forward to the proposal being brought forward for a community health centre. There is no doubt that we have seen a very successful model where clinicians whether they, they are dietitians, mental health workers, nurses, nurse practitioners, physicians, coming together in those multidisciplinary clinics actually work very well. So I look forward to that proposal. But I have to ask, with the greatest of respect, did the member opposite vote for or against building two new medical schools in the province of Ontario? Did the member opposite vote for or against capital investments of over 50 new or expanded hospitals? Did the member opposite vote for or against when we actually have expanded primary care clinicians, nurse-led practitioners, expansion of those clinics? Did the member opposite vote for or against? I know the answer. The next question, the member for Ajax. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Speaker, for far too long, Ontario's transportation network was neglected under the previous Liberal government. Ongoing failures under their leadership led to increased costs for riders and less service in accessing communities in our province. Speaker, this is unacceptable. Our government needs to take urgent action to make public transit easier and more convenient for the people in my riding. As a government, we need to ensure that we're helping individuals, families get to work, school, and appointment easier, safer, and more reliably. Speaker, can the Associate Minister of Transportation please share with the House what our government is doing to make more convenient to take transit? The Associate Minister of Transportation. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the member from Ajax for the question and for her endless work on behalf of her constituents. Speaker, I'm glad to inform the member that, unlike the Liberals, our government is delivering for riders by bringing Presto into the modern era. Speaker, our government introduced the credit card tap payment feature on Presto for GO, Brampton, MyWay and Oakville transit riders in August of last year, and it was met with terrific success. Well, Speaker, I'm pleased to inform the House that just last month, on January 23rd, we extended this credit card tap payment feature for riders in York, Burlington, Hamilton and in the member's own riding of Durham. The credit card tap system, yes, it's fantastic news for transit riders, Speaker, because Presto uh, is simply a game-changing when you modernize it. it is, uh, the fact is that eight participating agencies uh, mean that 700,000 taps have been used with credit card on these transit agencies, and achieving this milestone Response? so quickly, Speaker, demonstrates right. that our government is delivering transit improvements that riders want and enjoy. 
by improving this Presto system, Speaker, we're getting it done for riders. Supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you, Associate Minister, for his response. It was a pleasure to join you for that announcement. The people of my riding were left behind under the previous Liberal government when it came to transit investments. Making public transit more accessible for the people of Ajax and all residents of Durham Region and beyond needs to be a priority for our government. As a government, we need to ensure that transit is easier to take, more flexible and convenient for everyone. Reducing barriers to getting on the bus, especially for new users, means greater transit use, less emissions, and a greener province. Speaker, can the Associate Minister of Transportation elaborate further on what our government is doing to deliver on transit? Associate Minister of Transportation. Uh, thank you, Speaker. And the member is right. Uh, after 15 years of zero action from the NDP and Liberals, our transit system is not where it needs to be. And that's why our government is improving the rider experience with a refined Presto system. Our government is now building on our introduction of credit card tap features across the rest of the 905. In fact, Speaker, we are working to implement debit tap card payment capabilities at each of these 905 transit agencies that currently accept the credit card payment feature. What's more, Speaker, Metrolinx, on behalf of our government, is working with the TTC to update Presto devices so that both credit and, deb and debit payments uh, can be brought to the, transit, uh, the largest transit agency in our country uh, for Toronto riders, Speaker. We're not going to stop until we connect the whole grid with these payment options so that commuters can conveniently get to work, to school, wherever they need to be. Unlike the opposition, Response. Speaker, our government is turning Presto around and providing a modern, fair system that works today and for generations. Thank you. Thank you. Next question, the member from Mishkegawak, James Bay. Thank you, Speaker. Question to the Premier. On January 28th, the community of Winnisk tragically lost its fourth residence due to a house fire. Sadly, this time, it was a 10-year-old child. My sincere, my sincere condolences go out to the family and the community. This tragedy, tra tragedy occurred because the community does not have proper fire fighting, fire firefighting equipment and no fire department. How is, is this even possible? This is a fundamental necessary to set a necessity to protect and save lives. The community is asking the government for help. They have a fire truck waiting in Winnipeg. They need infrastructure. Monsieur le Premier ministre, what will your government do to help this community to ensure history, history does not repeat itself? To reply, the Minister of Northern Development. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and we pay our respects uh, to the community in the event there, similarly, uh, Shoal Lake uh, 40. Uh, a First Nation community in my riding uh, had uh, an experience uh, a fire that uh, com occurred in the community uh, on February 11th. And, and there is no question, Mr. Speaker, to, to the member's point, uh, that fire preparedness and readiness has been a long-standing issue uh, on reserve. Uh, I have notified the Chief in Shoal Lake 40 uh, of our preparedness to, to support them uh, moving forward, uh, Mr. Speaker, and to take a look at options that the province can uh, uh, do, Mr. Speaker, to support uh, efforts by the federal government to ensure that fire safety and the equipment necessary uh, uh, to enforce that or to bring that to a community, Mr. Speaker, is put in place. It's time. Thanks. The supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I appreciate the minister's response. But two years prior to this, the same community had a fire and we brought it to his attention. My colleague from Kuwintnam has mentioned many times of fires in communities. I ask again the question. What will your government do to prevent these communities, these isolated communities, so that it doesn't take a tragedy, a tragedy to make sure that we address fundamental needs of a community to protect? In Kuinun, the house was at the corner where the, the fire station would be. We have a sitting fire truck in Winnipeg. And we say we talk to the federal. Well, I think we have a responsibility as a province to make sure that we protect the First Nations community. So I ask again, what will your government do to protect these communities? Reply, the Solicitor General. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And our hearts go out with communities that have lost loved ones 
This is absolutely the case. But the Office of the Fire Marshal will support enhancements to public safety in all of Ontario, and particularly Northern Ontario. I have remained in close contact with Indigenous, provincial, and federal partners to ensure that First Nations communities across our province have the support that they need. Rien pour moi, en tant que as a Solicitor General, what, there's nothing more important than the safety in our province. Question, member for Thunder Bay, Atacokan. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Children, Community and Social Services. All women and children in Ontario deserve to live without the threat of violence. Sadly, incidents involving human trafficking and women fleeing abuse occur in our province. Many women, leave, many women that leave these circumstances often face challenges in finding support. These obstacles are more pronounced in rural and remote parts of Ontario, where distances make accessing resources extremely difficult. Everyone has the right to be safe. As a government, we are responsible for directly addressing this issue. Speaker, what is our government doing to support these women and children? Thank you. Minister of Children, Community and Social Services. Thank you, Speaker. I'd like to thank the member from Thunder Bay, Atacokan, for the, for the question, a very important question. Our government believes that everyone has a right to feel safe and to be safe. And we believe that no matter where you live, access to support and services should be available for the victims of gender-based violence and sexual exploitation. So we acted. We invested up to $6.5 million in support so survivors can access the services and supports they need to heal and rebuild their lives and to get their children access to the early interventions they need to heal from experiencing and seeing violence at a young age. And the supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the Minister for her response. All governments must respond to the reality that victims of violence and human trafficking from smaller communities face unique challenges. That difference is especially stark in Northern Ontario, where support services may be a great distance from where victims live. Despite this, access to these supports and timely and effective care in rural, remote and northern communities should not be overlooked. All governments need to take action to break down barriers so women who have experienced violence can receive the help they need no matter where they live in Ontario. Speaker, how is our government ensuring appropriate funding to meet the needs of women from rural, remote and northern communities? Mr. Children, Community and Social Services. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the member, uh, Thunder Bay, Atacokan, for the supplementary question. This funding includes up to $3.6 million ded dedicated to frontline agencies in rural and remote communities so they can strengthen culturally responsive supports for Indigenous women and reduce barriers for survivors of violence and human trafficking, for example, by providing transportation to and from counselling and legal appointments. This includes supports for First Nations organizations like the Ontario Native Women's Association and for community-based organizations like New Starts for Women in Red Lake and Centre pour Femmes Elles Vivent in Timmins. Under the Premier's leadership, we are ensuring that timely intervention and diverse care is available to help survivors where and when they need it. Question the member for Toronto, St. Paul. Thank you, Speaker. In September 2015, Carol Cullenton, Anastasia Kuzak, and Natalie Warmerdam were murdered by a man in Renfrew County. The perpetrator knew all three women. Their tragic murders led to the Renfrew County inquest, which last June made 86 specific and concrete recommendations to prevent intimate partner violence. The very first recommendation is to identify the problem and declare intimate partner violence an epidemic. Will the Premier accept the first recommendation from the Renfrew County inquest and declare intimate partner violence an epidemic? Thank you. To reply, the Solicitor General. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I want to thank the member for the question. My thoughts continue to be with the victim families and friends and all those who were impacted by this tragedy. Everyone has a right to live safely and with dignity and free of intimidation and threat of violence. And over the past six months, provincial ministries have reviewed the jury's recommendations. 
The work needed to understand, assess, and plan for the recommendations is complex, Mr. Speaker, and must be done with care and attention. As the relevant ministries work to provide the Office of the Chief Coroner with an update on these recommendations, we're committed to breaking the cycle of intimate partner violence and supporting to survivors to help keep our community safe. And I look forward to a completed review and recommendations before the summer. The supplementary question. Speaker, the government did not answer the question. One murder is too many. Since 1990, nearly 1,000 women in Ontario have been victims of femicide. Indigenous, Black, trans and rural women are disproportionately vulnerable. 68 of the inquest recommendations are for this province, therefore the government's responsibility. These are key to supporting rural communities where supports for victims of intimate partner violence are desperately un inadequate. I'll ask the government again. Will they implement the first recommendation and name intimate partner violence what it is, an epidemic? And furthermore, will they do recommendation number four and create the role of an independent survivor, survivor advocate to advocate on behalf of survivors and their experience in the justice system? The Associate Minister of Women's Social and Economic Opportunity. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And the member opposite is right. One death is too many. And that's why I'm proud that our government recently endorsed the release of Canada's first national action plan to end gender-based violence. And Ontario led the approach in forwarding the national action plan to the FPT Forum of Justice Ministers with a written request that they commit to taking further action to improve justice system responses, including holding a perpetrators and offenders accountable. In addition, our government has recently invested up to $3.6 million this year to support survivors of human trafficking and gender-based violence in rural and remote communities. On February 10th, Mr. Speaker, the government provided part one of Ontario's response to the <laughs> office of the chief coroner, and this response reflects the progress made so far. Mr. Speaker, we'll continue to response. work across government to provide an update and a comprehensive response in the future. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. That concludes our question period for this morning. The member for Ottawa, Vanier, has a point of order. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I am seeking the unanimous consent of the House that, notwithstanding standing order 40E, five minutes be allotted to the independent members as a group to respond to the ministerial statements this afternoon. For Ottawa, Vanier seeking the unanimous consent of the House that, notwithstanding standing order 40, 40E, five minutes be allotted to the independent members as a group to respond to the ministerial statements this afternoon. Agreed? Agreed. 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 Member for Mississauga Malton has a point of order. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, with utmost pleasure, I want to share the joy of something I have been waiting for over four years to welcome my brother, Shalender Anand, and his lovely wife, Sweetie Anand, visiting for the first time at this House of Responsibility. Bituvirji, welcome to Queen's Park. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. There being no further business this morning, this house stands in recess until 1 p.m.